Today we're talking about the most common mistakes volunteer or really any coaches make. And joining me, JP Nervin, you've been on a lot. He's a sports consultant, mentor, writer, public speaker. You can get all of his articles and podcasts, terrific information at his website on thriveonchallenge.com. And JP, you have a, have a book coming out called Calling Up. I think you can get some early release of it on your website coming in December. We're so happy to have you on again. But tell us a little bit so people understand where you're coming from, some of your coaching background and where you've coached. I started coaching at the club level, very just young ages, under 14s, under 16s. And over the span of like five years there, I, I ended up coaching professionally, collegiately. Uh, I was running camps for as early, young as five and six years old. And as, and as old as um, I actually coached like this women's, local team there of people that were as old as 50 uh, that had never played basketball in their lives. So I've been across the entire spectrum as far as coaching there. I really didn't even know what my intention really was. I don't know what drew me in there. I guess it was just, I loved basketball. I missed playing it. And I thought this was a way that I could stay involved in the sport. So I just kind of wandered into coaching, which I think happens for most people like in, in coaching, like especially parents, right? Is you kind of just sign your kid up and all of a sudden someone looks at you and they say, you might be the great coach here if we need. And all of a sudden you wander into coaching, right? All right, JP, before we dig in, I did want to bring up, especially to all the coaches out there, one huge part of being a coach, because I just went through this, is communicating with your team. And there's an app called Band, B-A-N-D. And we just partnered with them. It's a free group communication app. And they make it so easy to handle your team, assignments, send videos, organize them. It's really great. I used it myself. And you could download the app through the link I'm going to have in the post. And you'll even have a chance to win up to $2,000. All right, let's get right into it, JP. Your first mistake, you say, is modeling. Coaches don't model the behavior. What do you mean by that? So when it when I started out in coaching, um, I initially felt like I had a pass. And it's kind of really largely because of the way I saw other coaches coach. And, you know, from my experience, the coach was allowed to get away with certain behaviors, yelling at the referee, um, swearing in a locker room, um, raising their voice, uh, just, you know, the way that they treated other people. And so I kind of modeled those type of behaviors. And at the same time, though, I never modeled the behaviors that I expected of my players or even the parents. I would never let my players get away with arguing with the referee. And I would always kind of, you know, put my head down or get really ticked off if a parent was in the, in the stands going crazy at the referees. Right. Um, and that's just one example. And it can be any way we communicate through our work ethic. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, empathy or kindness that we expect of our players and the way they communicate with each other, you know, I never really modeled those behaviors. And, uh, there's a great quote from a guy named Joe Ehrman where he says that, you know, sports won't build character unless the coach possesses it and teaches it. And the big thing here is possesses it as well, because, you know, we talk about character, we talk about all these things that we value in our program, but we actually, with the most important piece is that we're actually modeling those behaviors. All right. Your number two, ownership. What is yeah. that lack thereof? Well, I, I love, uh, there's a, a great quote from Jocko Wheeling that there's no bad teams, there's just bad leaders. And I know a lot of people are really uncomfortable with that. Well, well, I could get a, a, a team of a bunch of really, you know, players that aren't talented or they're really entitled and they have bad attitudes and all that. But the reality is um, it's blaming the other people, blaming the parents, blaming the entitlement of the athletes based upon the way these kids were raised or the fact the previous coach screwed it all up and, and he's giving you a bunch of, you know, he, he didn't focus on development that does nothing for us because the only thing we really can change is ourselves, right? The only thing I can change is me and the way that I coach. And so if you do get handed a team that really you know, is lacking in talent, lacking in character, or you know, have a problem with entitlement or bad attitudes, it's still your team. It's still your responsibility. Now you may not have them like the San Antonio Spurs, the Boston Celtics at the end of the day, um, at the end of that year, but you can take them from wherever they are at and you can turn them around. And we all have heard of, you know, we've, we've watched the movies of the great coach, like the coach Carters and the stuff like that, that take and turn a team around. And, and 
you know, obviously there's a little bit of, you know, Hollywood at play there, but there, there is a truth as a coach we are the leader and we can have an incredible impact on the team more of an impact than anybody else out there. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Number three, vulnerability. You know, this kind of comes back a little bit to the modeling as well, right? Because you're not going to be perfect. And I think early on in coaching for myself, I felt like as a leader, I needed to be that strong leader, never showing any weakness, always had to have the right answer. You know, um, you know, at halftime, I had to have all the answers as far as, you know, the adjustments we needed to make, the right plays. And if any player was to question that or any parent was to question that, right, that I, you know, I, I would get defensive because it was like they were saying that I was a bad leader. And the reality is I was a early, I was a, in my first year of coaching and even in my 10th year of coaching, the reality is I don't have all the answers. None of us do. And sometimes the players are seeing things that we're not seeing out there. And so we do need to ask them and be vulnerable to say, well, what are you seeing out there? We do need to ask the parents. They're seeing things in their children's lives that we're not seeing. So we need to be communicating with the parents. And then when it comes back to modeling, it, you, there needs to be a bit of vulnerability here. You're going to make mistakes. And uh, in Daniel Coyle's book, Culture Code, where he kind of goes through all the great cultures and business and sports and the, and the Navy SEALs, you know, he says that there's something across the line of great leaders do is they say these three powerful words, I screwed up. And those are the three most powerful words you can say as a leader. I screwed up. When you start to take ownership, other people will start to take ownership. The parents will start to take ownership of the program. The players will start to take ownership. And doing, doing that, when you say those words, you're also modeling the ability to grow. Not just, you know, not just grow as a player, but grow as a person. I love that. Yeah, and you, you've done such a good job. I've learned so much from our talks and reading your stuff about being vulnerable and, um, and, and just how, what a difference that makes. All right, number four, empowerment. They don't give players and parents the opportunity to contribute in a meaningful way. What, what does that mean? So, you know, the All Blacks, New Zealand All Blacks rugby team, they have a great saying, leaders create more leaders. And I think a lot of time as coaches and leadership, I know I got into this trap where I really just was trying to create followers. I re and, you know, the difference between a follower and a leader is, is actually that they're going out and they're making decisions and they're actually having to, you know, take control uh, of what goes on in that environment. And a lot of times we just say, this is the way I want it done. Now go do it the way that I did. And that's not really asking a young person to, uh, to, to, be, to be a leader. And it's the same even when we're working with parents, right? You know, if we can give the parents some leadership opportunities in the way that we run our club, especially at youth sports, to help us out and to alleviate some of their concerns, we're going to have to give them some, some decision-making opportunities there. Now, Will they do things exactly the way we want them? No, absolutely not. Are they going to screw up along the way? Absolutely, but so are we. And so this is where you want to empower, you want to hand over and surrender some control, but you don't, do, you don't give them autonomy without support. You got to support them. And so when people make mistakes or when people do a great job, you're there alongside them to, to go through that process and say, well, what worked, what worked out well here? What didn't work out well? And so we need to find as many opportunities to give players the opportunity to have, you know, some decision-making um, things that really matter. Like I was talking to a coach the other day and I asked him, well, what, what kind of leadership things, you know, opportunities do you give your players? And he said, well, I let them pick uh, the kind of the, what they can wear for their uniform and their dress, you know, like what they're going to dress like on game days. And I said, so what you're really giving them ownership is over is how they'll look on game day, not actually how they'll play, but how they'll look. Right. And so, if, you know, they look crappy on game day, well, that's on them. Now, how they play, that's still on you, right? So by giving them that ownership, by giving them that autonomy, you're going to empower them to, you know, to take ownership of, of the team and what goes on. So give me, give me an example of a way a coach could do that. In like it, something. Yeah, great, great question. Um, so let's get a little practical here with it. One of the best things to do is to start with a warm-up, right? You have a way as a coach that you want to do the warm up in every day. And it's great to have whatever your sport is, you know, the same kind of warm up, that consistency, the first five minutes of practice, first 10 minutes of practice. So I always tell coaches, do that warm up the, the way you believe is the perfect way to do it. Just the most absolute perfect way to, to, to lead that warm up. Do it for a week of practices or whatever. And then bring in a few of your captains, your leaders, or, 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 or the players and team and say, all right, um, this is why we did the warm up this way. But do you have any suggestions on how we could improve the warm up from your perspective? Now you're giving them some decision making. So they're going to try a few things. And then you turn around and you say to them, okay, 
you know what, you know what, you know what to do. So you go run it tomorrow and allow them to do it. So now they've had decision-making into not just what, you know, uh, you know, what they're going to be doing, but you're giving them the, the autonomy to go out there and to go do it, right? And to make the changes. And if it goes really, really well, you can pat them on the back and say, that was a great recommendation, right? You know, that was a great suggestion there. You just made us a better team. Now they feel empowered. If it goes really poorly, you can sit back with them and say, hey, that didn't work so well, did it? Right? How might we change that for next time? And then you throw them back in there again. And that's training leadership. That's empowering leadership. I love it. I love it. Okay, next one, relationship. What do you mean there? Uh, great author and you know, child psychologist Daniel J. Siegel says that relationships trump any one particular behavior. And I always love that. And I think in coaching, I started off with thinking, all right, I need discipline. Like discipline was my priority. And really it wasn't. Like I coached for the relationships. You know, the, the, my crowning moment, I still come back to this, my crowning moment in coaching wasn't any championship and I've won plenty of those, was when two of my players in Ireland worked essentially at McDonald's for a whole year to save up money to fly over for my wedding. And, you know, that is the crowning. So it's the relationships, and it's getting texts from those guys. It's, it's, you know, running into former players. It's seeing whether it's the relationships that matter. But too often we get so caught up in the discipline. And we can't have real discipline. Discipline that doesn't just get compliance, but discipline that builds character and and, and without the relationship component of it. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing in parenting or any kind of leadership there. We just can't come in with the, the heavy hand and just trying to lay all down the, all these rules, all right? Let's build a relationship, meet people where they're at, meet their kids wherever they're at with their behaviors. Because, you know, there's so many different coaches listening to here and you're coaching in different contexts and they're coming from different situations, even within your team and different backgrounds. And we've got to meet the player where they're at build that relationship and then help them in, as an individual. And so it's the same with parents. Like if a parent does something we don't really like or agree with, that can't be like, well, I'm not talking to them or they're, you're, they're a bad parent. Like you've got to respect and see them as a person first. Right. And so just seeing what they do on the sideline does not necessarily mean that they're a bad parent. Maybe they've just kind of fallen into some bad habits as far as the way that they, they parent as you know, as a sports parent the way to practice, to put that into practical use. So some parents, some coaches have kids for a whole season of high school or whatever, but for volunteer coaches, it's so short and so quick. I did a summer league. And so what I did was I just would sit down at the beginning of every practice and take five minutes and just ask them various questions about a, their goals or even just what they had done that week, their vacation, trying to pick up something. And at first, I'll be honest, like we would have those talks and then I'd get into practice and, you know, it just seemed like it really wasn't getting anywhere. Like I I was trying to build those relationships, trying to do that, get to know them a little better. But by towards the end of the season, and I would remember little things about where they went on vacation or someone was getting a new dog or whatever, you know, just try to bring those back in. And I really could see it. It takes, sometimes it takes time for that arc to happen and to occur and to really kind of get that connection with them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the reality is young people don't need more coaches today. They don't need more teachers. They need people that want to mentor them, that want to build a relationship with them, not as a player, but as a person. And there's a big distinction and you just shared it there. You're asking them questions about their life outside of that sport. The reality is we are probably losing sleep way more than they're losing sleep over the sport, right? This is just, they're there to have fun. And when we lose, you know, we, we stress way too much about the sport and they get tired of talking about it. Totally agree. All right, JP, thank you again. Thrive on challenge. You can hear, see, learn a lot more from JP. Um, We appreciate you taking the time and I know we'll have you back very soon. Thank you. Absolutely.